It's four o'clock on Friday. Woohoo! And it's time for another exciting episode of Taxi's Quarantini Happy Hour. Yeah, baby! Thank you, fake audience. Thank you, fake band. Really bad fade. Let's see who's in that chat room. Uh, hello, John Pearson, Dan Weber, Bob Gunnerfeld, Uwe Shai, uh, Martin Gravel, John Pearson, uh, Dean Turner, I think I already said Dan Weber, um, Patrick Adams, Robbie Hancock, hey, Alex Dillon, Daryl Berman, Andre Stepanian, the crew is ready, willing, and present. Michael Reschke, hope I got that right, Nancy Kalel. Um, hey guys, how are you? It's Friday. Damn glad it's Friday. Can't stop looking at myself. <laughs> oh man, been a, felt like a long week, but probably because, I, was it last week that was the short week? I think, I don't know anymore. Um, hope you guys are doing well. Um, I have a little surprise lined up for you in a couple of minutes, I'll tell you. Uh, wow, it's Saturday there already. Um, okay, where are you from? Sweden? Norway, right? Um, I think so, yeah. Hello, Edmund. Darren Moss, hello. Michael Smith, how are you? Greg Carroza, yay. Um, man, oh man, oh man. Oh, that's right. It's a Saturday morning in Australia as well. And Keith LeBrant is present. Uh, Andrea Bottino, Happy Ron, Rick Cabot Podmore. Woo, big Friday in the chat room. So first of all, I want to say thank you. Um, Several of you posted ideas after yesterday's show, which I greatly appreciate. Um, and then about two hours ago, I had an idea because I, I've gotten two emails since uh, the show we did with the uh, mystery library owner. Um, and uh, both of the emails said, yeah, I got a check out composer catalog. Tell me more about it, Michael. It's like, dude here's the link go check it out for yourself um so today's show momentarily i am actually going to call the creator of composer catalog none other than keith lebrant um i've been slammed with other taxi work for the last two hours literally i, I just like got it together to get the show on the air about a minute before we went on today so uh, I haven't written any questions for Keith, but uh, I know him so well that uh, I think I can wing it. And um, I think, uh, hello, Il Rosso. I think that uh, if you guys have questions, it would be a, a great time for you to chime in with questions today. Um, let's see, what else do I want to tell you? We have... On Monday's show, another music library CEO is joining us, and this music library CEO uh, was a taxi member that had a, an exciting uh, chance meeting near the bar area at his very first road rally. I'm, I can't even remember now, five, six, seven, eight years ago. Um, and that meeting led to him kind of getting on the path and he became a, uh, a successful taxi member um, who is no longer a member because he is now a music library owner and successful at that as well. And if you know his name, please don't blurt it out anywhere. But um, I think his perspective is going to be really interesting because he's been both a member and now a library owner so we can ask him stuff like uh, so now that you're a library owner are there things that you would like to say to your well I, your fellow members your former fellow members and uh, you know uh, get a perspective that we haven't gotten from anywhere else I mean he's been on the inside and the other side of that fence hello Mojo Bone Mark Real songs from a headband um 
So anything else you guys want to ask me before I give Keith a call and we get going on that? Hello, Ken Bearden. Yuka Reshki. Reshki. Yeah, Reshki. Yuka. I actually, if you guys have never tried the vegetable, the root vegetable, yuca spelled U-Y-U-C-C-A, um, it tastes like it's relatively inexpensive. You can find it in every grocery store in America, usually near the eggplant. Um, it, it's a root, and it generally is about that long, about that big around. Um, it's brown and looks like it's got bark all over it, which it does. And just use a potato peeler on it and uh, peel the bark off, which comes off relatively easily. Um, and then cut it into sections and boil it like you would potatoes. And trust me, if you like baked potatoes, you're going to love yuca because it tastes like a much more flavorful baked potato. Um, and it's allegedly very high in nutrients. So there you go. Uh, oh, the Jocko story. I already told you the Jocko story, right? Can I say which quadrant of the, of the country does the mystery library owner reside? Um, not in the U.S. There you go, John. <laughs> um, Is it possible to put up the stream a bit before it starts? Uh, I was hitting refresh a bunch of times before it showed up. I often see other streams do that. Um, possibly, I will have uh, Ariana and Bria check that out. Um, today, if we'd put it up before I showed up, you would have seen me running back. I was outside watering tomato plants. You would have seen me running back inside and scampering around to try and get all the lights turned on and get the hair and the makeup done and get the microphone in place, all that kind of stuff. Um, Mojo Bone wanted to answer your question. You had about three weeks ago, but wanted to answer it when you were on the show. Do you remember what it was? Greg Carrozza wasn't able to get the stream until 5.02. Yeah, we'll have to check that out. Um, oh, uh, as far as the story, I'll, I'll re, uh, reiterate the story very quickly because I want to get to Keith. Um, okay, so I lived in Fort Lauderdale. I worked in Fort Lauderdale. I had a studio named Triad Recording in Fort Lauderdale. And a very good friend of mine at the time was a guy named Peter Yanellis uh, that owned uh, the Artisan Mobile recording truck. Uh, it was a van, like one of those uh, GMC campers, but he converted it to a mobile unit. And he was definitely the high-end mobile unit in South Florida during those years, and I believe still is. And uh, he was very good friends with Jocko and all the guys from Weather Report. And sometimes they would come and jam. He had his uh, mobile unit parked in a warehouse bay right next door to my studio. So uh, if you had like driven, uh, you know, your fist through some sheetrock, you probably could have seen his van. Well, there were times where Jocko and some of the guys from Weather Report, um, I think he brought some steel drum players back from the islands once, and they were just jamming in the warehouse and recording it all on the van, in the van, uh, in the mobile unit. And uh, Jocko was around all the time, and I got to know him. And over the next several years, our friendship developed a, a little deeper. I was never as close with him as Peter was, or certainly not as close as he was with the guys in Weather Report. But, um, you know, we hung out, we were friendly. There were a couple times we went out for beers together, uh, went out for burgers, whatever. And uh, I was in Los Angeles working on a record out here. I believe I was, I want to say I was staying at the Biltmore Hotel in downtown LA for some reason that time. And the phone in my room rang because cell phones didn't exist. This would have been somewhere around 1979, 1980 maybe. Um, and they said, we have a collect call for you from uh, Mr. Pistorius. And I went, what? How the hell? I, maybe he contacted somebody at my studio and that's how he found out where I was. 
but he was calling me from a jail in the Florida Keys. He had been arrested for drunk and disorderly. Um, probably wasn't the first time that happened. Um, I believe that, he, I hope I'm not getting this right, and I certainly don't want to tarnish his memory, but it's kind of funny. I think that he was stark raving naked and on the hood of a car on the Keys Highway or something like that. Anyway, all I know is the guy found out that I was staying at the Biltmore and called me collect and said, Michael, can you come and bail me out? And I said, Jocko, you just called me in Los Angeles. Uh, no, I can't. <laughs> so, <coughs> excuse me. Sorry, that was part of a, I just purloined a uh, chocolate chip cookie. Uh, and that's a whole other story. Anyway, um, so I think I called the studio and had uh, my co-workers at the studio call Peter uh, Yanellis to go bail him out. Anyway, that's my, uh, my Jocko story. Um, and the chocolate chip cookie my wife made, we have another couple coming over for dinner tonight. My wife made some incredibly good chocolate chip cookies with granola in them, of all things. But she had some really tasty granola, granola and she mixed that in there and they came out incredibly incredibly good so uh, she let me have one when they came out of the oven and uh, then she said and you don't get any more well my wife just went out to run some errands and uh, I went in the kitchen to look for the cookies and she had hidden them if you can believe that um, but did I find the cookies why yes I did did I shove one in my face it was literally chewing down like the last bite trying to swallow it before I hit the the start button on today's broadcast so there you go all right um, okay uh, let me call mr. LeBrant um, mute your speakers dude here I come I can barely hear you to well, say, hello, hello. You okay, know? there you are. Yeah, I can hear you now. Can you guys hear him? Okay. Say something else. Something else. <laughs> <laughs> um, not bad. Uh, let me see what they say in the chat room about your level. I'm going to go turn off my air conditioner because I'm sitting right by it and it's kind of loud. I'll be right back. I never thought I would get the phone a friend call. Lifeline friend from who wants to be a millionaire. I'm ready with all my uh, knowledge. <laughs> All right, there we go. Here, let me tilt the microphone down a little bit. Uh, let me pull out my uh, thing that holds the phone up higher and closer to the capsule of the microphone. All right, you should hear him pretty well now. So, uh, right. yeah, people are saying a little low, in fact. Um, and you, I'm guessing you're right up on your phone and all that. I am, yep. You know what? Let me... Uh, you call me back. Let's see if the connection gives us any more level. All right, you got my number, right? Uh, I hope I do. Let me. Um, yeah, let me give it a shot. And if you don't hear from me in about two minutes, give me a call back. <laughs> All right, <laughs> thanks. All right, bye bye. Ah, cell phones. Well, we can hear that just fine. Hello. Hello. That was weird. Hello. Okay. Let's try this. Yeah, it still sounds like crap, but it's. I think it's the best we're gonna get. Um, You're going all all the way from Jersey, so I mean that's that's a that's a long distance, right? Yeah, there you go. Uh, okay, I am going to raise the volume on my microphone a pinch. I've got it cranked pretty hot right now. Testing one two. Testing one two. All right. There we go. Sounds good. Sounds fine. Five by five. Sounds okay. Yay. All right. All right. We are good to go. 
Okay, so um, I've known Keith for how long have you been a taxi member, give or take? I want to say 2007, around there maybe. All right, so wow, 13 years. I knew him when he was just a boy. Um, <laughs> but, you know, Keith is one of those people, uh, as you guys have all become friends, um, Keith is one of those people that I recognized pretty early in the game in his, you know, time period as a taxi member that this is a serious guy. He's a really good player, a good writer, and a hard worker. And... Uh, you know, he's had a full-time job all these years um, doing web development and programming stuff and uh, has a family and uh, a lovely daughter, Olivia, who I hope is nearby. Um, anyway, uh, Keith knows that I, I was going to say that I'm fond of little girls, but that didn't sound right. <laughs> no, having... Having four daughters, you know, I know all the stages of like diaper changing to I love Ariel to, um, you know, all the phases of Disney princesses that little girls go through down to, you know, you got to have the Ariel hairbrush and the, the, the nightgown and, you know, in the wig, right? Am I right about all this, Keith? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> uh, we, so, just, we just gave her, uh, in order to talk to her friends, uh, we are... Uh, with the, the Facebook Messenger for kids, so the parents really locked down for parents. But now, like I just got inundated with like eighty-seven emojis, you know that <laughs> 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 rapid fire. <you> know? <laughs> well, uh, you know, so uh, Keith sends me pictures like Olivia, you know, when she has a birthday party, or Olivia, you know, in front of the fireplace with the Christmas stockings kind of stuff, and, and I always enjoy them because it brings me back. First of all, I'm just happy for uh, Keith and his wife that they've got a lovely little girl, and uh, it, it always makes me kind of miss those days. So uh, it's funny thing is, when my wife just left the house about, I don't know, 10 minutes ago, um, actually 19 minutes ago, um, she, I helped her out to the car with some stuff she was taking with her. And on the front seat of her car was a brown paper bag. And she said, open it. And I did. And I pulled it out. And it was one of those little tea towels that you have in a kitchen. If you're a woman, typically men don't have tea towels. I hate to sound sexist about it, but let's be real. Um, and it said something about, uh, I got a fork to comb my hair, and I've got seashells and this, you know, it, it was a, a tea towel that was talking about Ariel. So my wife had actually right. gotten that for our daughter, Hannah, who's now uh, grown up, but she still loves Ariel. So there you go. It never goes away. <laughs> so um, tell us about, you know, like some of your better placements, how many libraries you're in. I think you're over 700 different shows that you've had music on now. Am I right I about that? Eight, eight hundred now. I, I found really, eight. Yeah, eight hundred. Yeah, eight hundred. I'm probably two royalty statements behind. I, I kind of was slacking on uh, keeping track of that. But yeah, last I last I did it was, it was over eight hundred. Wow. Um, I'm gonna raise you up even more and get you closer to the capsule. There we go. Um, so eight hundred TV shows, dude. That's incredible. Um, yeah. yeah Right, fortunate. Yep. Do you have any idea how many placements you've had in total, or is that uncountable at this point? I, I know years ago, I think we did this before, year, years ago, uh, and that was 32,000. 30? I want to say needle drops, needle drops maybe that, that was back, but that was like a, like years ago, so I'm not sure. I'm not oh, man. Sure it, well, be. you know, you've gone from 600 to 800 shows yeah. in a matter of like 18 months to two years, I think, so... That thirty-two thousand, and when he says needle drops, he means you know it could be one one cue that got used three times in a show. So that yeah. would be counting each one of those three drops. Um, yeah. Wow. Someday when you have a moment, uh, send me an email with all those numbers again. I'd love to blast that out to everybody. That's really inspiring, man. Yeah. And, and you do it in you know like in your spare time. The word spare being in quotes. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, not to, uh, I always talk uh, good things about taxi, but you guys made the contacts, you know, and then once 
You just got to deliver and, and be consistent. And, and very fortunate that I was able to, you know, get the contacts and the forwards and the deals and all. You know, I, I never would have thought, not, you know, back when I was playing original music in bars and clubs that, you know, this was a thing. And, and we took a shot and gave it, you know, I remember uh, kept on saying about the uh, taxi's a scam. There's no way it's going to work. You know, they're just taking my money and, and look, look at it now. So it's, I have you to thank. So I always, I always thank you. Well, I always thank you for letting me know this stuff, and I'm always proud of you because um, you're just like the nicest guy, and you really deserve this. You know, nobody likes to see jerks um, be successful, but everybody loves to see somebody who's got a good heart and a great work ethic and a lot of talent um, be successful. And you are that guy, and you inspire all your fellow members by being that guy. Um, somebody in the chat asked, how many uh, hours a week do you typically get to work on your music? Uh, well, now, obviously, we have a, some more time. Um, but it, it depends on, I guess, the workload I have. But I would probably do maybe, I don't know, maybe every other night if I'm really, uh, I guess the average, maybe like two hours a night. Um, you know, um, but if it's... If, Depends, like, I guess, on the, the project. Like, if I had a deadline, then obviously I'm going to put the pedal to the metal and put more hours later on at night. But right. And normally, if I'm just kind of uh, creating some stuff without a deadline, I'll make sure that I, I at least put like an hour in or something like that, just to just to keep the ball moving. You know, wow. Go forward. Um. Yeah, I can't believe you've gotten that much done and that many cues made, and. I mean, it doesn't sound like a very intense schedule. You know, you're not a, as crazy as, uh, oh gosh, uh, why am I drawing a blank on his names? Because I'm terrible with names. Um, I remember in uh, in Salt Lake City, or he lives uh, just outside of Salt Lake that does um, like orchestral trailer cue stuff. He gets up at 4.30 every morning. Oh, uh, Randon. Randon. Yeah, Randon Purcell. Yeah. I mean, yep. so you're not getting up at 4.30 in the morning, are you? No, I'm more of a night person. So if I'm going to put the hours in, it'll be at the uh, back end of the day. <laughs> right, okay. Um, yeah, my, my cues would sound really bad if I did it four in the morning, I think. <laughs> so, uh, what are some of your favorite placements? Uh, the ones that pay well first, uh, that would be the ones that would be the best. Uh, the favorite placements, I guess one was... Uh, it's a TV movie. Now, I thought it was a cool placement because it was about uh, what was it? Who was the? She murdered her husband with an axe. Uh, oh, Lizzie husband. Borden. Yeah, Lizzie Borden, right? But what happened with that playlist, the the, the uh, soundtrack? It was done in. It was a movie about Lizzie Borden, but it was the music was more contemporary. So I thought the um, you know the music supervisor and everyone took a real chance on that and the Black Keys were actually on that movie too uh, and I just thought it was cool to hear the juxtaposition of that kind of music versus you know that kind of movie so uh, just different you know what I mean yeah um, and you had didn't you have a Hot Wheels commercial years ago I did yeah, yeah I did a Hot Wheels commercial um, that was funny because they had like uh, I guess one of the six-year-olds kind of uh, test out the, the music, you know, and, and say, well, what does this make you feel? Does this make you feel like you want to, you know, play with the Hot Wheels? And you go back and make revisions, and uh, it was a, definitely an eye-opener. Um, and I just got a recent placement on a TV movie to be named, uh, which is cool. It was kind of a on a whim thing, you know, it's me this right away, and, and you know, it took me like an hour and a half to put it together, and, and uh, knock on wood, it, it, it got the placement, so... I'll wow. be hearing about that. Yeah. Um, do you do cool. most mostly songs or instrumentals? Mostly instrumentals. Um, I've been doing some collaboration collaboration uh, more recently. Uh, Marcus, as you know, I'm doing some stuff with him, uh, amazing singer, and uh, doing some stuff with Ethan Paul, uh, Otten, and Paul Cuffman. So I've been, been talking with that too, but mainly it's, it's instrumental stuff. Um. And how long does it take you to do a cue typically? Let's say maybe three hours, four hours. It really depends on, um, you know, if it's something very com complex, then it'll be a little bit longer, but that's kind of the average. Um, if I 
sit down at night and really you know put the pedal to the metal uh, i can finish it by the end of the night so. um and i know that you're primarily a guitar player do you do keyboard stuff as well i do yeah i do i compose everything so it's you know i do the drums keyboards uh, guitar thing when <laughs> when needed um and uh, John Pearson commented that you get great guitar, great guitar tones. <clears throat> what do you typically use? Uh, do you go through an amp or do you go through an emulator? Uh, how do you get your guitar sounds? Uh, the majority of them are the Kemper profiling amp. Okay. Uh, and then sometimes I'll I'll go to plug-in route, and there's actually some really good ones coming out these days. Uh, STL tones put out one. Um, Neural DSP uh, is another one uh, that's, that's, they're really getting good. I got to admit, like, it's, it's amazing, you know, so, but they're the two that, that I usually would lean on. Um, Edmund Red wants to know, um, oh, where, oh, he took it away. Uh, <laughs> he had a question, he just retracted it. <laughs> Uh, what genre do you typically write in? Do you have a favorite genre or most frequently done genre? I guess more in the pop rock vein of guitar, you know, um, stuff like that. But I you know, do the typical tension, drama, all that stuff. But for me, uh, when you can kind of let loose on guitar a little bit. Um, it's funny, the other day, about two days ago, I think I was sending uh, a link to a YouTube video. Um, oh, again, I can't remember the name of that show. The husband and wife that have that uh, HGTV show in Texas. Uh, she's got long, dark hair. He's got red hair. They're oh, really, yeah, yeah. Um, a fixer upper. Anyway, because yeah. uh, uh, Steve Barden is going to join me on the show in a couple of weeks. And. I asked him if he would do a guitar-based cue live. He did one years ago, and then recently yeah. he did a keyboard cue. Um, so I asked him if he'd come back and do an updated version and do a guitar cue live, and he said, sure, what do you want? And I said, uh, preferably something light, airy, breezy, like you'd hear on HGTV. So I went and found a, a, like a five-minute promo or something for a fixer-upper and sent it to him. And as I was scanning through, looking for good cues to send him, I'm absolutely certain that one of the cues I heard in that show, which was kind of a combo of uh, electric and probably a Strat, and uh, it sure sounded like you, man. I, I, I almost called you up at that in that moment, but I was kind of pressed for time. Um, but do you know if you've had any cues on HGTV stuff on, on, oh, yeah. on that show? Definitely had stuff on HGTV. Uh, I would have to look up that show specifically, but yeah, yeah, HGTV, I always see all the time. So. Um, Andre Sapanian wants to know what make of guitars do you use? Um, all across the board. Uh, I got Fender Strats, Tellys. Uh, it really depends on what I'm doing and with the style of music. But I just bought a Kiesel guitar before this whole you know, the whole COVID thing happened, and um, I was really impressed with that guitar, actually. They uh, they build it, like, on demand, so you basically go through, you know, an option, a menu of options, and you build it, and you pick everything you want, if you want the neck roasted, what kind of pickups, and all that stuff, and then they make it. It's about a 10 to 12 week time frame to get it back, Yeah. and then what happens is you have about 14 days uh, to try it out, if you like it, cool, if not, you know, you can send it back, get your money back, unless you created some custom options that, you know, kind of negates that, right? But I was actually really impressed uh, with, with their guitars. What was the brand again? Tiesel, spelled K-I-E-S-E-L. They used to, they're, they branched off of Carbon. Oh, okay. But, so, but the song kind of went and took Carbon and kind of split that, split that up and made it a custom guitar, you know, section of that, so... Uh, but wow, they should. Have, they could have just shortened that name and taken out the S E L and made it a T H, and then it would be called <laughs> Keith Guitars. <laughs> so, I honestly, I, I remember when you called me a few years ago and you said, "Hey, I'm creating this software because um, I'm having a hard time keeping track now with all these submissions and libraries that I'm signed to and all the various." Um, 
you know, iterations of any particular cue that I send out. And, uh, and that was, you know, you're doing it, I believe in Excel maybe. And then also, and you built, um, composer catalog. Can you tell everybody kind of what the elevator pitch for composer catalog is, and then we'll get into some details about it. Sure. Uh, so the software, um, basically organizes your catalog. It doesn't write anything to your audio files. There's no metadata getting put onto the audio. Actually, just think of it as a, like a library system for your cues. So, uh, when I was doing my, my tracks, uh, it was getting a little crazy because it, I just couldn't find anything on the spot. Like, I wasn't, and there, I'm sure there are Excel G, you know, wizards out there that can do the macros, and I'm, I just, I never did that. So, I wanted to know right off the bat when a publisher contacts me, hey, do you have anything that sounds like, you know, the Foo Fighters? that I can just go in, type in Foo Fighters, and it will show me things that were signed that weren't signed. So, I, you know, that way I kind of had all those options available to, to check out. So I started, um, you know, writing the software. I have a programming background. Um, so basically the software, you, you can add writers, you can add publishers, and you can add um, uh, session musicians. So if you work with other people that you do work for hires for, um, so those are the kind of things you do in the beginning. You would kind of list out your publishers. And then after you get all their contact information, uh, in there, if you want, if, if you want the contact information, but that's, I actually put in the notes for a lot of the publishers, the requirements, because half the times I forget, you know, so and so, how do they like their, their files? Is it wave files? Is it 1648? Is it 24? So I kind of put a notation in there so I can just quick look it up. Um, and then you can add tracks. So basically you would go in and add a new track and it will ask you, uh, the only three things that are really required are the track title, the track type, whether it's an instrumental or song and the genre. That's the only thing that's really required to get it in the system. It's a database system, um, uh, on your, on your machine. So, but it goes way further than that. I sound like a salesman, but wait, it goes way further than that. <laughs> uh, Thanks, Ron Pope. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You can, um, I'm, I'll go through it. Like, you can notate if it's registered, if, it, if that track is signed, the song key, the track length, BPM, um, and also the track status. So you can actually keep track of where it's at. Like, is it written? Is it done? Is it mastered? Is it sent to a publisher? Is it sent to Taxi for a listing? Like, my next update that I'm doing right now allows you to put custom track status. Because a lot of people were trying to trying to say, okay, okay, I just need to know what I submitted to Taxi. I said, that's great. I said, but I can't, I can't make this Taxi specific, but I can put an update in there and make a custom track status. So then you, as the user, can say, well, did the taxi at the track status or, you know, um, signed to so-and-so, you know, so you can make the custom status and that, that alleviated that situation. They could figure out what they had submitted to taxi. So, uh, and that's kind of like the first tab and then there's different tabs for the tracks. You add your writers, uh, your, and the publishers. And the nice thing about the publisher, and this is the problem I was kind of having with Excel. Say you had a non-exclusive that was signed to two publishers uh, at some point, right? Right. So then, uh, so, so with this, it kind of links everything together. You say, um, you know, here's a track. The first time I put it in, I put in publisher A. And then I just got signed to publisher B. So now I would go back, find that track, and add that publisher. So now both those publishers are linked. Uh, and then with Excel, it was getting crazy to kind of do that um, now, just to figure that out quickly and, and stuff like that. It also has the ability, uh, Composer Catalog, to add co-publishers. So say there's two publishing companies kind of involved with that track. You can you can do that. And with this, the musician section, section, say you're using like um, session musicians, say a work for hire uh, situation. So you you could list out their the, you know, the session musician and, and kind of where they stand as far as did I send them a work for hire? Did I not? Um, so you kind of have a, a an idea of where you're at with that, uh, with session musician stuff. There's another tab for lyrics if it's a song, so you can go through and, and have your lyrics in there. Uh, there's also a generic comments section, so if you had anything that you wanted to put in there, 
you know, with regard to the song, were uh, I, I used to tell people in the beginning for the taxi stuff, well, you can put in there for, you know, send to taxi. And then I have a search feature that searches the comments for any text that you just put taxi and then or anything that you wanted, it would bring everything up. Uh, and the important section, I feel, is the, uh, the metadata section. So you put the track description, um, you can select different moves of the track, uh, different keywords that you put in, uh, instruments that were used, TV shows that fit the feel, and then bands that sound similar. Um, and again, this is all not required, but it's nice to have. Right. Because all this stuff, is, all, the, is, all this information is searchable. So then I'll go to that search section and say, when that publisher asks me, hey, do you have anything that sounds like Foo Fighters? All I'm going to do is put Foo Fighters in the band that sounds similar section, and then it's, it's going to bring up you know, that stuff. And better yet, you can even drill further and say, okay, bring me the Foo Fighters, but just give me the stuff that's not signed. And then it would just filter it even more, so now you know what's available that sounds like Foo Fighters. So you can really kind of hone in on that request that you're looking for, um, that way you kind of feel confident. Yeah, this, these, these are the ones that are signed. These, these aren't signed. And there's a section for your pro information if you have like a registration number. And then you can also um, point to your uh, audio file. And I say point because this is just a database. It doesn't, you're not importing an audio file. You're just pointing to it. So if it's on your machine, say in a Steam music directory, uh, you could then say, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to point to this so now you can have the ability to play that track through Composer Catalog. So say you, you know you found a track, but you, don't, you forget what it sounded like you, you loaded 10 years ago. Let's hit play, and it's going to play that track um, that you have on your system. You can also designate any alt that you had. So you, you can put into that track, this is my main mix. Here are my three alt mix. So they're all kind of grouped together. So, so that's cool okay. because you're not redundantly putting the music in two places on your computer. By pointing to it, you only have to have it in one file versus duplicating Correct. that file and dropping it into Composer Catalog. That makes sense. Yeah, yeah, and I didn't want exactly that. You know, I mean, I didn't want to, the ability to now I gotta now I, I put it here, now I gotta put it there, and and there's sometimes where you, where you have a track that maybe you don't want to put all the information in just yet. Uh, so then you just kind of put in what's required and, and come back to it. Now, as this program has been uh, going through its iterations, I've been doing free updates throughout it. Uh, so then most recently, I've been doing track profiles. And what a track profile is, you say you, you're constantly putting in information for publisher A, you're constantly, you know, on a, you're, you're doing tension cues for them. So now all you do is do a track profile fill in the stuff that's, that you're always typing in. So I'm going to put in publisher A, I'm always the writer, I'm going to put in, you know, tension, I'm going to put in all my, my, my keywords, or whatever, whatever's going to be consistent every time you put that in. I'm going to save that as my track profile. So now the next time I do a tension queue, I'm going to put in my system, but instead of typing everything in again, I'm going to use that track profile. It's going to now overlay the text that I have in the profile to a certain section and it will be pre-filled. So now if I, if I want to go back and change anything, I can, or if I just want to keep it, you know, what I have in my profile, it's going to be all pre-filled now. So I didn't have to type a thing, except for, you know, the track title, obviously, it could be different. And, and anything that might be different about that track compared to the others. Um, earlier, just a minute ago, you mentioned that it, it could point to alt mixes. I'm assuming that it also points to stems as well? It could point, honestly, to whatever you want to consider an alt mix. So, I'm, you know, if you want to say the word stem, you know, I, I put it in as an alt mix, but you could, you could easily group that uh, stem in there. Um, but for myself, I, I started out with the main track and then any alt, like, to me, would be like uh, bass and drums. You know, that's, that's, that's an alt mix for me, so I throw that in there. But what I found when I, when I started this was that it never, uh, it never, like, I, I could have ended. Like, I could have developed this for like five more years because there's always something, or, or there's always something that somebody, you know, wants, or, or this would be cool if you had this. And, right. <laughs> and I found that, that you know, I needed to, to put, the, <laughs> put the period at the end of that sentence and, and get it out. And then in my mind, I'm going, okay, uh, now the most requests that I get, I'm going to then, you know, put into a free update. So I've had about three or four free updates throughout the lifetime of this software. 
Um, so people are kind of gaining value throughout throughout the uh, span of the software. Um, does it point to my wife's chocolate chip cookies? Because seriously, <laughs> as fascinating as you are right now, I'm sitting here looking across the kitchen. She's got them hidden underneath a dish towel. And I'm just looking at her and go, would they notice if I jumped up and ran and got a cookie, but I shouldn't eat on camera? <laughs> um, several what you, people. What you have to do is you have to have a picture of you on this, like a screenshot that's static. You know, and there you go. There. <laughs> that's a great idea. Um, which, uh, what kind of workstation do you use? Uh, Pro Tools. So I got a Windows 10 uh, that's, that's recording uh, Pro Tools. Okay, cool. Good to know. People are asking. Um, yep. Yep. Uh, somebody just asked a really. Oh, Rick Cabot Podmore asked. An, uh, Podmore asked. A, I like Popmore. I'm changing your name, Rick. Um, he gets accused a lot uh, for writing in Egyptian keys, G sharp, E flat, etc. Does it really matter when it comes to getting placements which keys you tend to prefer? Uh, pre prefer? Apparently that well, last cookie that, was the only, least. Keys that, <laughs> the only keys that get placements are D minor because they're the saddest key of them all. Um, <laughs> no, just, just kidding. It honestly doesn't matter. It could be anything. I, I, I have keys in any, any key, so... Uh, one thing I've noticed about uh, a lot of your work is you're really good at restraining yourself from throwing in the kitchen sink. Um, <laughs> your stuff always has just enough. And, and sometimes, I, I mean, I've heard some of your like pop rock stuff that's probably a strat. Um, and it's just, it's simple. And, you know, it, it's more about the feel and the emotion um you don't show off how great you are as a guitar player you just do what needs to be done did it take time for you to develop that skill that you know to recognize uh that less is more yes absolutely uh, when i first started uh taxi i was thrown in the kitchen sink you know i was actually creating many songs uh that were like two two three maybe probably two minutes but real short songs because that's where I came from. So I was, I was recording verses and a pre-chorus into a verse and going back, and it was real just, just short, though. And then I, you know, I realized after going to rallies and, and listening on the, on the forums and, and what people were getting signed and deals and stuff like that, what it took. And really, it's everybody wants to put in the kitchen sink because they feel they need to be justified, you know, as far as, well, I can play, you know, I, I got this. And I, you know, it, it would be great to hear. And that's, but for film and TV, you got to think about it. There's people talking over this stuff. So when they want to do 30-second note sweep arpeggios all across the uh, fretboard and some guy's trying to talk over that, it's just not going to work. So your strain is the uh, is the key word there. And it took me a little bit. But once I started getting the idea from you know, from what I was hearing and, and starting to see success with that uh, minimalization of the, of the cues, then it hit home. And that's, that's what I needed to do, so... You, I, I do get a kick. You asked me about cues that I like doing. I do get a kick when I'm asked to just flat out shred. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it's always a fun thing. Uh, I just had a publisher recently. I just sent him. I was working on some instrumental, just personal stuff. Uh, and it was like kind of a you know, little shred going on. And he was like, oh, my God, I, I can't believe you actually can can do that stuff. You know? And he was <laughs> pretty, pretty jazzed about it. So I was doing some... some uh, rock stuff for him and he, and he emailed me back he's like hey uh, don't I, I wouldn't mind if you wanted to put some lead down on some of that stuff you know and, and so it's, it's always funny to, to to surprise people I guess when you, when you throw the kitchen sink in like that and just shred it up uh, but yeah for, for placements you're not going to really do that that much <laughs> um do you find uh, that you've had to alter your mixing style over the years, or does guitar-based stuff kind of stay the same? I mean, obviously, keyboard-driven music, and we can talk about that in a moment, but keyboard-driven stuff changes fairly rapidly with whatever the flavor of the month is, you know, on, yeah. on playlists uh, or on radio. Um, guitar stuff doesn't change all that much. Maybe it's because I, I don't make cues that I haven't noticed it. Have you noticed uh, any sort of uh, progression in, in 
sounds or the way you have to mix or the way you produce, or is it fairly static? It would really be, you know, uh, I guess like the indie, is it, is it doused with a bunch of reverb? You know, like you kind of keep your ears out for that. Like what's, what's the, the, you know, the effects around the guitar. The guitar tone is always going to be a guitar tone. You're using a Strat, whatever, you know, that's not really changing it. But like a synth can change, but it's more the effects around that guitar. Is there, is it, you know, is it piled on with, with reverb? Is it dry? Is it, is it direct? Is it a direct sound? Is it, you know, overly distorted? Is it a, a fuzz kind of distortion compared to a tube screamer kind of distortion? So you kind of assess what you're going for and what you're listening to that way. Um, the sound itself from the guitar obviously aren't changing, but you kind of need to know what, you know, what things to kind of put around that guitar as far as the effects wise. Um, what do you use for an acoustic guitar? I have a Larrabee, which is kind of like, I believe from what I read, it was kind of like the, the Canada's version of a higher scale, whatever, Taylor, you know, something like that. Uh, and I bought that many, many years ago. Um, and it's hysterical because like where you strum, it's actually disintegrating because it, it's so old. I, I played, I used to play like every Friday night in Philadelphia. So it, I really wore it down, but it, the tone is incredible on that thing. But I, I was always happy with that acoustic. Uh, what do you mic it with? Uh, right now I have a the Slate virtual mic. I just purchased that a couple months ago. Wow. Um, yeah, I can't say enough good things about that. Um, it's really, I, I bought it on a sale thinking, all right, I'm going to give it a shot and see what this is all about. I got a good deal on it. And I was really impressed. Uh, I like the fact, you know, again, it's another, you can record something and change the options afterwards because you can change the actual mic, you know, uh, the mic modeling uh, of that. So in case you wanted something different, you lay it down um, and then you can actually change the mic and the, and the sound while you're mixing that. And when you're recording, there's no latency. So you can throw on like a compressor and, and EQ with, with his, you know, his effects and stuff like that. So you have a pretty polished sound in your headphones, which is always good. It's the same thing with vocals too. You can really get a, a good polished sound, which would in turn inspire the vocalist to, to you know, sing better. Wow, it's all gotten so easy <laughs> so from yeah. back in the uh, day when I did you know it. You know what, it's almost, like you have too many options. I got not to sound like the old fart, but it's like, <laughs> you know, you're, you're sitting there like, now I got, I just, I, I laid down my vocal and now I have 10 months to choose from when before it was like, you would have that all done in the front, you know, front end of thing. Yeah, but you know, once you laid it down, you were stuck with it and now you're not. That's amazing. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Uh, it's a, a little heartbreaking for an old guy like me who learned a lot about, you know, the craft of using microphones well. It's like, but you know what? Hey, cars are better than horse and buggy, let's face it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I think it's, it's, it's amazing. Like, um, I was just doing a cue and I needed some sort of anthem kind of stadium, you know, uh, claps and, and stomps. And, you know, normally you, you would get in a room and if it's by yourself, you're recording in different areas of your room with that mic and then you're panning the living daylight out of everything or you, you get 10 of your friends over and, and, and now you go on the web and it's like a $5 sample library for contact and, and you throw it on there and, and adjust it to your taste and, and you're done. So <laughs> it's amazing. Technology is amazing these days. It really is. Wow. Um, let's see. Does it point? I asked them. I'm looking at some of the questions that the guys have asked that I've written down. Uh, no, 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 no. Oh, uh, how much did the uh, the slate rig cost you when it was on sale? Oh, I, they just ran a sale now. I, I thought I saw it going across. I want to say it was four hundred, maybe five hundred, something around there, maybe. Wow, for what it does, that sounds like a reasonable price. Yeah, yep, yeah, definitely, definitely worth it. I get excited when I look at the Slate Raven, but um, I've not heard, I haven't heard terrible stuff about it. I don't think Stephen Slate makes anything that's bad, but yeah. it feels to me a little bit like the Raven really never took off. And I don't know if it's, a, for those of you who don't know, the Slate Raven is basically um, a large touchscreen console. So it makes old dudes like me happy because you get to move all these virtual knobs and faders that lay out like a console in front of you, but it, it's virtual. And I think that's cool. 
But yeah. uh, I remember when I was visiting uh, Criteria Studios last November or late October, right before the rally, they had one in a little side production room and I asked them about it and he said, nobody ever turns it on. And I was a little heartbroken. Uh, yeah. It just looks, it makes perfect sense. You know, if you like the topography of a regular console, but you want to work yeah. in the digital domain and have digital control, it seemed like the yeah. perfect solution to me. I don't know. Maybe I'll... Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. It seems like that was the perfect compromise of, of the console, you know? You yeah. Um, yeah, and I never I, I never hear bad stuff about it. I just don't hear people... When it came out, everybody's like, wow, that's the shiz right there. But then it just yep. never really took off. Um, John Pearson wants to know, what model mic was that slate that you use? Uh, it's the... Uh, it's the large condenser one. So I think they come out with a, a small, almost like a pencil type microphone, and then a large condenser. All right. Um, so, so probably have, kind of like an 87 and a yeah, yeah. KM84 for the pencil right. mic. Got it. All right. Um, let's see. Any other questions, you guys? We got nine minutes left. In... I saw a question about do I use one mic or two for acoustic? I just use one mic. Oh, okay, great. Oh, you're watching the chat. Great. Um, let's see. This hour is going by quickly. Yes, it is. Um, but it's Friday, you know, and we're hanging out with Keith and we're learning oh, stuff. We're not talking about gophers or fishing. How cool is that? <laughs> well, what I've, what I've done, Mike, is uh, I've also put together a, a deal for Composer Catalog. Um, okay. I'll keep it up the weekend. Um, if you go to composercatalog.com uh, slash taxi TV, uh, <laughs> right there, uh, I just put it on the, the chat, right? Hopefully it goes through. Um, but yeah, composercatalog.com forward slash taxi TV, all one word, uh, you'll get $20 off. So. Wow. So what does that bring the price down to? $69. I mean, that's cheapest snot. For everything hey. that it does, for the one time it pulls your butt out of a fire, um, that's incredible. I mean, but the fact that you, you know, uh, as I mentioned to you on our phone call a couple hours ago, um, somebody who I have tremendous respect for that has his musical and business life totally together um, made the mistake of uh, sending a song that was already signed to an exclusive library to another exclusive library. He wouldn't have made that mistake if he is, excuse, excuse me, I burped right in the middle of that. If he were using um, Composer Catalog, he could have easily avoided that. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's, I just feel that, especially for what we're doing, um, and if you're really serious about it, like it, it's just a, a great tool to have. Um, going forward, um, I'm looking into the online version. I wanted to start out with the desktop version, so that will uh, happen down the road um, as far as I kind of tie up a couple loose ends on the updates on this one. But I just feel, especially if you're just getting started, that it's a great tool to have just to keep you on point. Um, uh, just knowing that what I guess the experience that I had with the, with the spreadsheets and when it got a little crazy, like why wait, you know, not to sound like a, a greasy car salesman again, but like why wait until you have a thousand cues on the Excel spreadsheet and you feel it's the wrong you know, tool to use, put something in a database that you know, can do the work for you. Um, Mark Real wants to know if you ever get placements for your older material, do you have stuff that's, you know, still in the catalog that's never been signed? Uh, I really don't have anything that's not signed, but I'm getting places all the time for older material. So it's, it's kind of like we talked about it. It's a 401k. You, you know, you, you, the more you make, the, you just keep on feeding the machine and, and it gets, uh, it gets replaced. I'm not going to ask you for a specific number. That would be rude. But how many times, like X, you know, from where your income was the first year you made money from placements to where it is now? Has it grown twofold, fivefold, twentyfold? Oh man, um, my ballpark. It has, uh. I could say. Uh, let's put it this way: if, if I was. If you just took what I'm, I guess, making through licensing uh, and 
times it by two as far as a full-time gig. Say I was doing full-time, it would be over six figures. So it's 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 been a blessing. Like I can't. Wow. It's ama- I'm amazed. You know, as far as uh, what you can do, you know, and really put your mind to it and, and create the create the music. Um, Rick White is asking a question, which I'm actually going to answer. Uh, do you need to make full songs for cues? No, you don't. Cues are a whole different thing. They're largely, almost entirely instrumental, and they're not laid out. They're not constructed or arranged. Uh, the the song form, it's not typical song form, Rick, where it's like intro, verse one, um, you know, B verse lifts into a chorus, and then verse two, and repeat that process, and then a bridge, and then a vamp out. It's not that stuff. Basically, it's like little to no intro. You slam right into what would normally be the chorus, um, and somewhere in the middle, you might throw in a B section, which I'd say is probably 80% of the time people have a B section, which is kind of like a bridge. Uh, you, you, you build it up, you break it down, you build it back up, and then you go for the big finish with a, a buttoned ending or a stinger ending, which means non-faded, boom. So there you go. There's the quick explanation. Um, let's see if we have a couple more questions. Um, why don't you go full-time making music with all those cues? Talked about it many times, and it's more of a why rock the boat situation at this point. I'm, you know, I'm constantly moving ahead with uh, income with the music and, and still having a consistent... Um, pay job as far as the money coming in. Um, so, you know, at, at a point, uh, if something happens, like, like I, I talked to you about it, I, I got laid off from my job for about a month. Thankfully, they picked me back up now. Right. In that time, it was like 40, 40 days, I created you know, whatever, 40, 42 cues. So, you know, I worked my butt off, I got some, and that was a, a lesson because at that point, as soon as I knew I was laid off, I contacted my publisher contacts anybody and, and was able to, to gather some work for hires and, and you know up, uh, different licensing stuff so uh, it was I was able to you know parlay what I know uh, in a time of need which was, which was pretty cool um, and down yeah. the road if something happens then maybe I'm doing full time but for me why rock the boat how old are you now if you don't mind me asking I am I am 48 are you kidding Dude, yeah. you look like you're about 36, 37. <laughs> wow. I'll, I'll send you your money later. I know. I had no idea. Seriously, I don't think you and I have ever had that discussion. I was so far <laughs> off. On uh, Man, oh man, you do not look that age. So, yeah, I mean, you're doing exactly what I've been recommending for years. You're building the retirement fund. You know, at some point, you're going to want to... Just do music full time and you will have made a nice living uh, doing the web thing all these years and you go full time on the music, you're already going to have, you know, six figures a year coming in from the music anyway. And then when you can ramp it up to full time, you could easily turn that into a quarter of a million dollar income for the last 25 years of your life. It is a blessing. You know, there's times where we needed a roof or, or we put in a new bathroom and that was able to you know, pay with that stuff with like a, a quarter royalty statement. So it's 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 great. I mean, it's amazing. I, if you asked me years ago, you know, could this happen? I'd be like, nah, there's no way. Wow. <laughs> and, and you had never done any music for media before you joined Taxi? Nope. No, I was always in original bands or, or did solo stuff, you know, played the bars and clubs and stuff like that. But, and what was your uh, so original? What was your original motivation for joining Taxi? I was old, you know. Like no, nobody wants to play a club on a Wednesday night and try to bring their friends in, uh, you know, and get paid, and not really have any following. You know, it just got tiring because I've been doing it since probably eighty, eighty-nine, you know, ninety something around there. So uh, I just needed to kind of sit it and do something else. And it was honestly my wife's idea to. to uh, uh, try try the whole music for TV thing and wow. start researching that. So you did actually join for the purpose of doing music for TV. It wasn't like you, yeah. you joined trying to get your music that you made with the band out there or anything. You actually had that yeah. TV mission in mind. That's cool. Yeah. yeah. Um, and, and tell your wife that I thank her for that. I, and she she's a keeper because a lot of spouses, whether it's a wife or a husband, whichever way it goes, um, 
you know, think that it's kind of like a fool's errand or Fulton's Folly or something, you know, it's like, oh man, you know, my, my musician spouse that, you know, thinks something big is going to happen, but wow, you know, that's the cool thing about doing music for TV is it's incrementally growing. It, yeah, you may not have the hit song that makes you a quarter of a million bucks in a year, or you may not have a hit record that makes you a rock star and you know creates a touring career a few years down the road, but it's that incremental increase in income every year, just like you're doing it, that allows you to retire better than the vast majority of rock stars. Yeah, yeah. And, and for me, I'm still doing, like, I just put out an album uh, uh, to the, you know, for me, for a personal album. I'm still doing that, but because I, I still need to do that every once in a while. But, um, you know, with the TV stuff, one night I could be doing a rock song, the other night I, I could be doing some, like, uh, you know, synth based. Next night could be something drama, attention. You know, so you're always changing it up. And I think that's what I really enjoy about it, uh, because you're not doing the same thing. Good. And it's a challenge. I, I've been doing more recently some some urban uh, uh, cues or, or uh, songs and stuff like that. And I really needed to kind of take a take a deep dive into the textures and what they do and the production styles and stuff like that. And I'm still learning, to be honest with you. I'm not I'm not a, a master at it at all. You know. And I think that's the fun part for me. You're never. I just told my wife the other day. I, you, you never master it. You never <laughs> like guitar. You, you're never mastering guitar. You're never mastering mixing. You're never mi- mastering engineering. You're, you're old. You can always learn something. Right. Wow. Well, this has been extremely inspiring. Uh, you know, every time I talk to you, even though I've known you for a number of years and know you fairly well, and, and we do talk several times a year, I'm always hearing great new stuff from you. And uh, I want to repeat one more time for the folks who will be watching this after the live broadcast. Check out ComposerCatalog.com. Uh, if you're watching over this weekend, Keith has the software for sale for $20 off. It's taxi.com. I mean, <laughs> yeah, taxi.com. Uh, it's composercatalog.com slash taxi TV. Um, if you need to organize your musical life so you don't make fatal mistakes by sending this something that's been signed already to yet another company, or if you need to search your database to find out uh, if you have a certain type of music that remains in your catalog and is unsigned and we would be good for a pitch that's out there, um, for keeping track of your co-writers, um, which songs are registered with your PRO, Every little detail you can think of is baked into what Keith has created. And I think the reason it's so good is, you know, as you say, I think on the website, it was built by a musician for musicians and, and you do keep improving it. So man, congratulations. I'm, I'm happy for you. I'm proud of you and uh, grateful that you had the time to hang out with us today and tell the folks in, in taxi TV all about it. Thank you very much, Michael, for your time. Uh, Again, appreciate uh, the opportunity to talk. And also, just real quick with that, you can download a trial that's completely open. The only restriction is that you can only put in five tracks. And I, I did that purposely so everybody can take a uh, listen to it or, or work with it. And if it's not their workflow, cool. You know, and then move on. You know, so that way you're not wasting the money. And then say, ah, this isn't for me. So you have a chance to check it out. And, and if it's not your workflow, then that's cool. You know. Yeah, you know, and if they're going to do that test on those five tracks, they should enter all the information they possibly yeah. can. Go take a deep dive um, okay. just so they can get the, the full experience. Um, that's a great idea. I mean, not, not my idea. I mean, great idea that you built in, uh, you know, the trial version like that that's fully capable. Um, all right. Well, Keith, have a great weekend. Give my best to Jessica. Give my best to Olivia. Um and thanks man uh great talking to you and uh hopefully i will see you in november if the governor and the uh mayor of governor of california and the mayor uh come around and uh back off of their uh having us chained our houses yeah hopefully that happens yeah all right be well keith talk to you soon buddy all right have, have a great weekend guys bye-bye bye-bye Great guy. You can just hear, even through a speakerphone, you can tell what a good guy he is. He, he's so humble, 
so honest and so good hearted. And uh, I got to tell you, I don't know why it affected me in such a big way, but uh, when they had their daughter, Olivia, I, I felt like I was part of the family and I've been uh, attached to them as a family unit. Ever. I don't know why, but it touched me in, in a great way. Um, anyway, uh, so that's that. Um, have a great weekend, everybody. Really glad you could be here for the show today and hear all that great stuff from Keith. And know that, don't forget, on Monday, um, we are going to have a music library CEO that used to be a taxi member. And you are going to learn a lot uh, from this gentleman. And uh, that's it. So without any further ado or a don't, that was corny. Have a great weekend, you guys. Bye-bye.